Did I just ruin 10 hours of work with a split second of inattention? Stay tuned to find out. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on my big steam engine this week, and again, one of the interesting things about this being such a big engine is that it starts to need big engine things like cylinder lagging, and that's what I'm going to do today. What is cylinder lagging, you ask? I'm going to explain that and lots more right now. Here's the cylinder on the top of the engine, and this recessed area here is not just decorative, that's actually space for insulation. Remember that steam engines are external combustion engines, so unlike your car where heat is the enemy, on a steam engine heat is precious and you have to do everything you can to keep it in, and that includes insulating the cylinder. The kit comes with this large piece of brass sheet stock here with which to wrap the cylinder and contain that insulation. So our task here is to get this bent to shape and to put a whole bunch of fancy holes in it in just the right places. In order to do that, I'm going to use this piece of heavy cardstock here, and I'm going to make a template. There's a large hole for the steam port and two smaller holes for the drain valves on the cylinder, and they all have to be in just the right place on this complex shape. So I think a paper template is the way to go to get all of that stuff just right. With the paper cut to the size of the brass, I can wrap it around and kind of see where I'm at, and immediately I can see that the steam port is going to be the main challenge here. So I'm going to use that as the reference for everything else. I'm going to mark its rough location as best I can on the back here, and then I've got a piece of scrap stock that's the same diameter as that cast iron boss, and I'll use that to finish the circle here. I'll cut this hole out first, and then hopefully I can use it as a reference to locate all the other features. This steam port boss is a funny shape and in a funny place and at a funny angle, so it's going to be challenging. So I think by doing that first, I can increase my chances of success here. Now, right away, I've got some issues with the location of that hole. I'm not super happy with this. Looking around the other side here, you can see that the stock is kind of misaligned there, so it's a little bit crooked in alignment, and I don't like where this overlap is. The overlap is kind of right in the curve there, which is not a good place for sheet metal to end, because it's going to be hard to get it to, to lay flat there. Really, I want the, the split line to be over here in the middle, where there's a nice large flat section. The great thing about cardstock is, you can just do it again. So I made another piece, and I'm going to try this again. And this time I arranged it so that the split is in the middle of that large flat area, and I got much better alignment this time of the boss, such that the cardstock lands straight at the edges and remains aligned with the top surface of the cylinder there. Then I did the same process to get the steam drain valves aligned, the holes for that. I need to be able to install and remove the valves with this lagging in place. So I made sure that there's clearance for that around the valves there so I can unthread them as needed. You can see some tape on there because I did actually need two tries to get this hole in the right place. That's the great thing about the cardstock again is that if you make a mistake like that, just put some tape on the back, put the piece of paper back in, and cut the new hole in a new place. All of this would be very difficult to do in brass sheet metal. The next task is to lay out where all of the tiny, tiny bolts are going to go that will attach this cover. I'm going to put one right on the end for sure, and then I need to space them all the way around as evenly as I can, but they also have to miss all of the other features on the cylinder, like the studs for the cylinder head and the valve head and so on. There's a lot of steam passages and other little things here that we have to work around because we don't want these bolts to punch into any of those areas. So I used a seamstress tape for this because it was an easy way to get an even spacing all the way around while being able to see right on the physical piece if there's going to be clearance issues. With everything laid out on the paper template, I bust out the 3M spray adhesive, and I'm going to aim this away from face and away from camera on this piece of MDF here, which is going to act as a sacrificial fixture plate. MDF is great for this because it's actually made to quite a good tolerance. It's very flat and very smooth, and it takes that spray glue very nicely. And then I spray it again, and put my paper template down on top of the brass. This is a reasonably low precision operation because all of the holes in question here are clearance holes. And so rather than meticulously trying to measure everything, I'm just gonna be drilling to my layout lines directly on the paper template. Now I can hold my nose and clamp this MDF into the mill just like a fixture plate. Best not to tell the mill what you're doing here because it will be insulted by having this artifact of dead trees on it. 
And just like you would indicate in a fixture plate, I'm gonna kind of do that here with my paper template. I've got a pointer in the spindle and I'm just lining it up with that pencil line there. That bottom pencil line is my reference. So I line up one corner, then run the table down to the other end and tap the board in until the pointer lines up with that end and then run it back to the first end, double check it and so on. And you go back and forth like this a couple of times and you can walk it in just like you would walk in a vise when you're indicating it. Once you've got it to where the pointer is right on that pencil line all the way down the length, then you can tighten down the clamps and we can call this thing dialed in. I'm going to make the big hole first, so I'm going to line the spindle up on it using a three quarter inch end mill because the hole happens to be three quarters of an inch. I don't have any gauge pins or stock that size, so I'm using the end mill, but it can be difficult to tell exactly where the flutes are on an end mill. So here's a trick. Hold a one, two, three block up to the side of the end mill, and that will find the top surface of all of the flutes. And it's much easier to see if the bottom edge of the one, two, three block is aligned with your hole than it is to see if the flutes of an end mill are. Now I am going to use an end mill to make the hole, but not this big three quarter inch one. Four flute end mills are not very good at plunging, even the so-called center cutting ones. So I'm going to start with this two flute center cutting end mill. And I'm using end mills here and not drills because when a drill breaks through sheet metal, it has a lot of lifting forces and it's very likely to pull the part up and mangle it in the process. Whereas an end mill has some lifting forces, but not nearly as much. And if you're careful, you can just break through the far side of the material without ever lifting it and make a very nice clean hole like that. And once that's started, then I can move up to the four flute. Again, I would actually prefer a two flute for plunging like this, but I don't have a two flute three quarter inch end mill. You can see that I do get a little bit of lifting here right at the end, and that's because this end mill has radii on the end of the flutes, so I had to go deeper with it to get a clean hole. If you're going to do this trick with end mills, I strongly recommend the smallest radius that you can get on the flutes of your end mill. You want sharp corners for this to work. I'm also going to refer you to an excellent video that Mark Presling did recently about how to drill clean holes in sheet metal with normal twist drills. He's got great tips in there. Link to that below. Next, the drain valve holes, and those were done the same way, except this time I do have a gauge pin the correct size. So once again, I lined it up on the first one, and then as a sanity check, I ran it down the y-axis to check the other one, because in principle, these two holes should be perfectly aligned on the y-axis if I've done my job correctly, and it looks like they are. So while I'm here, I also note the y value on the DRO so I can get back and forth between those two holes very easily and repeat these positions as needed. Again, very conveniently, these holes end up being the same size as an end mill, so I just used a two flute center cutting end mill to very carefully poke my way through there without lifting the stock. Again, if you stop just as you get through the stock, then it'll make a nice clean hole without ripping that material right off of there. If it pulls up a little bit, it's okay. The glue will hold it to some degree. And pro tip here, if you have a left hand flute end mill, that's the perfect tool for this because that actually applies downward forces, not lifting forces, which will actually pin the sheet metal in place. To drill all the tiny clearance holes for the mounting bolts, I am just using a drill. The lifting forces of a drill on sheet metal are proportional to the size of the drill, so a drill this small is really not likely to cause any harm, and you can just drill straight through as if it was not sheet metal. As I work, I'm keeping the sawdust to a minimum, both to keep my mill from going on strike out of sheer indignation, and also because the sawdust will absorb the oil and get into slides and cause a mess. The mounting bolts here are 256, which are really tiny. Here's a standard metric Swarfy the Duck for scale. You can see how small these things are. But wait, what's this? Is this an adorable tiny slip roll? Why, yes it is. This was actually sent to me by an amazing viewer. When I first started on this engine project, a viewer wrote and said to me that he had built the horizontal version of this engine, and when it came time to roll the lagging cover around the perimeter of the cylinder, he built this tiny slip roll to do the job. And he asked me if I wanted to have it so that I could use it when the time came because he didn't need it anymore. Amazing, right? This thing is absolutely beautiful. I absolutely love when people build tools like this. So I've got it set up in my vise here, and I'm going to give it a whirl just to kind of get the feel of it with some scraps here of brass that are the same gauge as that cylinder cover is. And I did have a little bit of trouble here. 
I was not able to get the rollers tight enough to where they would start to introduce a curl in the material without the gears slipping. Those plastic gears that you see are press fit onto the shafts and they were slipping on the shafts. So I thought, well, I can fix that thinking I'm smarter than the tool. I partially dismantled it and set it up carefully here in the mill and just center drilled and drilled a tiny hole down through the gear and the shaft in the center there. And then I tappy tap tapped a roll pin right down the center of the gear and the shaft there to lock it in place. I did that to both gears there and gave it another try. And this was working much better now. It has the oomph to roll that material through. So I worked my way down a little bit at a time on the tightening bolts there. I'm counting my turns there. I'm doing like an eighth of a turn at a time, just a little bit on each corner, try to keep them all even. Gradually work my way up to more and more of a curve. Well, this was going great right up until that sound right there. Yeah, that was me breaking a tooth off the plastic gears. You see, it turns out I'm not smarter than the tool. The slipping of the gears was actually protecting them from breaking because they are just plastic gears. So when I reinforced them, well, something else failed. The tool still works, but it's just a little crunchy when it gets to that broken tooth. At this point, I realized maybe the stock is supposed to be annealed for this. So I went over and annealed this piece of scrap here and gave it another try. Annealing brass just means you heat the whole piece up to a cherry red and then let it cool down. And it gets very, very soft when you do that, like butter soft. And after doing that, well, this tool worked beautifully. With very little effort, you can see I got a really nice roll on this piece of scrap. And frankly, with minimal effort, I managed to get a really good match to the large end of the cylinder here. So this seems to be working really well. I wanted to try a different technique though, so I annealed this second piece of scrap and I just wrapped it around the small end there by hand. If I didn't have this adorable slip roll tool, annealing it and wrapping it by hand is probably how I would do it, so I want to compare the two methods and see which I think might work better for me. And if the curve isn't perfect, you can also use a little bit of hammer forming to fine tune it. The challenge with the slip roll tool is going to be getting the two curves on the same piece the exact right distance apart. And I wasn't confident in my ability to do that, so I think I am actually going to use the hand wrapping technique. Given that, it's time to remove the paper template, so a little bit of heat breaks the spray glue off of there. There's no glue in the world that can stand up to heat. And the same heat popped the brass off the MDF there as well. Now, of course, there's a little bit of goo on there. I think residue would be the technical term. And some acetone takes care of that in short order. For this kind of light duty adhesive fixturing, a lot of people also use double stick tape. I'm sure that also works very well. I don't seem to have any, so I use the spray glue. All clean and ready for the next step. And the paper template survives perfectly fine, so if you need to reuse that for something, you can. For example, if you were making more than one of this part. Time for the big annealing now. This will be very easy. I've got a temporary hearth set up here at the back of the shop. And I'm just using this hardware store Map Pro torch for the heat. This is plenty of heat for sheet metal like this. And I actually do this in the dark because it's easier to see when the temperature is reached. You're looking for a really dull kind of cherry red. You can just make it out in the video here. It doesn't have to be very bright red. The trick with a larger piece like this though is to make sure that the whole piece is cherry red at least once. Otherwise you'll get weird rigid spots in the material and it won't wrap nicely. Once that's cooled down, it's time for the moment of truth. I'm going to use the drain valve holes as a place to bolt the stock here to start with. I actually had to make those little brass bolts because the drain valves have a really weird thread on them. They're 3 16 40, and I've never seen a 3 16 40 bolt, so I made some. And that's going to clamp down effectively this end of the piece so I can wrap it around. And I'm going to take my time here and get it really square before I start doing this because if you're not really square when you start, by the time the wrap gets around to the other end, it's going to be misaligned and that's really difficult to fix. So I'm really taking my time here getting it squared up and then I'll tighten those bolts down and 
If I did my job right, then this will wrap all the way around and stay straight and square to the cast iron. Okay, here goes nothing. So I'm just gonna apply nice even pressure all the way around and I'm watching the top edge of the brass and the top edge of that machined surface of the cylinder casting there. I'm doing my very best to keep those aligned. Moment of truth here on the steam pour opening. And that looks like that's aligning quite well. It's not perfect, but I would say it's very good. And again, just making sure I'm staying flush with that top surface as I work my way around here. This kind of thing works best if you get it the first try, but you don't have to. The material will stay soft for a few manipulations. It will work hard and eventually, but you can then anneal it again if you need to. And you can just fine tune with a little bit of hammer forming there as needed to get that edge aligned. You can see I've got a little bit of a misalignment at one end there and some hammer forming of the bottom to straighten that out, corrected that. And I'm very happy with that fit now. It's looking really good. For the next step, I'm going to need full access to the cylinder casting. So I have to remove it from the engine, which means dismantling the top half of the engine. I was hoping not to have to do this until it's painting time, but there's no choice. I really need to get access to the cylinder here because it's time to drill all the tiny threaded holes all the way around. There's supposed to be 22 of them. And for that, I'm gonna use this piece of aluminum here and I'm gonna make a mandrel. Over to the lathe now, and I'm gonna turn down a shouldered section here at the front of this piece that's gonna allow me to clamp the cylinder on the mill in a way that allows me to rotate it into different positions. You'll see how this all works here in a second. You might also notice I'm using a tangential or diamond tool holder there. It's a recent donation to the channel. That's by Eccentric Engineering. I have to say, I really, really like it. Tangential tools are kind of an old school thing that's been rediscovered by hobbyists. They have very simple tool bit geometry, which makes them appealing, and they are a very kind of flexible, general purpose turning and facing tool. I've been really enjoying it the first few times I've used it here, so you'll definitely be seeing a lot of it. I'm taking my time here to get a really nice sliding fit on the cylinder bore here. I want this to be a secure fit that will still allow me to rotate the piece as needed. That's looking good, so I'll square up that shoulder and now I should be able to slide the cylinder casting on here. And the idea is that the mandrel is a little shorter than the cylinder bore and thus I can drill and tap a hole in the end and clamp the cylinder in place from the end. To that end, I will now drill this out tapping drill size for eh, whatever was a handy bolt size. I grabbed a quarter 20, so we'll go with that. Tappy tap tap. Yeah, I think that should work just fine. All right, over to the mill now. I'm going to set this up with a V-block here. I don't have a collet block big enough for this, but a V-block will work fine. And then I can slide the cylinder on there and clamp it in place. Now, in principle, this holds the cylinder casting square to the mill. Of course, I'm relying on the straightness of the unmachined portion of that aluminum bar stock there, but that's gonna be sufficient for this because commercial stock is pretty well made. And these are tiny and short tapped holes. So some tiny amount of misalignment caused by this setup is not even gonna be noticeable. Unfortunately, I can't slide it all the way on there because it's not clearing the bolt that sticks up above the nut that mounts my vise. So I removed the vise and chopped down those bolts, which I've been meaning to do for years anyway. And now we can slide that on there. What I'm gonna do here is use the cover that I've so carefully measured and marked and drilled and bent as my drill guide. 
I'm going to bolt it in place using those weird bolts that I made once again. And I'm using a one, two, three block to get the edge of the sheet metal really nice and square with the machined top surface of the cylinder there. Once again, if this isn't kept in alignment, then it's going to create a giant mess. With that aligned, I tighten down the bolts and then just by eye, I get the first of the bolt holes pointing straight up on the part. And this is just aesthetic, so doing this by eye is good enough. And then I use a gauge pin the same size as the clearance holes to align the spindle on that hole in the brass there. And with that carefully aligned, I can now center drill right in the middle of the brass there and then drill through tapping size. And this drill isn't going to touch the brass, of course, because it's smaller than the clearance hole that was drilled in the brass. And then I can come in and tap that hole. Now we don't have a lot of depth here. We need as many threads as we can to get the bolts to see all the way down. So I then follow up with a bottoming tap. And in the interest of efficiency, I've got two different tap wrenches with the two taps preloaded, which really helps. And then I can install the first of these 22 tiny bolts. Just make sure that my hole depths and everything are all correct and the bolt goes in nicely. And then once that process is established, I can speed it up here in the future because in principle, if I did my job right, each pair of holes is aligned on the X axis. So I can just translate over on X, again, using a gauge pin to line up on the hole. I don't have to touch the Y axis and I can line up with that other hole. And then once that's done, I know all the other holes at this end of the cylinder will be at the same value. So I've got my X and Y coordinates on the DRO essentially, which speeds this up considerably. After each pair of holes, I then rotate the cylinder around the mandrel, again vertically by eye, line up the first one with that pin, and again I have my X values for the two columns of holes already set in the DRO, and I can go back and forth quickly, and I can have my tool changes that way. The key to the way I'm doing this is that I'm working my way around away from the edge that I started on and I'm drilling, tapping, and installing the bolts as I go. And the idea is to keep the shield tight as I go around because keeping it tight is really the key to a good result here in the end. With all the bolts in, save the last pair, I can finally scribe the piece for length here because this is very, very close to its final resting place. And I want to get this seam just right, so I waited till now to do it. Now there was one pair of holes that I had to skip because I couldn't turn the valve body fully downwards like this. So I put a little block in there up against the vise body and that will allow me to clamp the piece further out and allow the valve body to clear the bolt on the vise there. And now I can access this last pair of holes. Okay, so I've got all but two of those bolts in there looking good so far. Now I have to take them all out again so that I can cut the piece to length before I can drill and tap the last pair of holes. To do that, I'm just going to hold it in the vise here like this. I'll zip off most of the material with the Dremel here. I'm just making sure to stay proud of my scribe line there. And then I'll finish that up with a coarse file and then a smooth file filing carefully down to my scribe line there by eye. As I go I'm doing test fits until I get a nice seam meet up there that I'm happy with and that's looking really good. That was a bit tedious because every test fit I had to be sure to install all 22 bolts or else you're not getting a true reading of where the material is going to lie when it's fully clamped down. And then with that in place, I can then set it up in the mill once again, drill and tap the last two bolt holes, and Bob's your uncle, we are done with that. Now for the actual insulation, I've got this uh, ceramic batting material that I bought for silver soldering setups, and it's used for insulating kilns, that sort of thing. It can take plenty of heat, so it'll be more than good enough for this application. A lot of people also use silicone cutting mats for this because they can also take the heat. So you can cut slices of cheap dollar store silicone mats up and slide them in there if you like. For finishing, I thought I would uh, go ahead and try a polish on this part. I'm going to start with the Scotch-Brite wheel, which will remove all of the tarnish and discoloration from the torch and the handling and so on. That leaves a nice shiny but satin finish. 
You can see the before and after there of the Scotch-Brite wheel, the effect that that has. Now, once that's all cleaned up with the Scotch-Brite, I can swap in the buffing wheel, and I'm gonna go for a close to mirror polish on this. This is a stitched wheel, so it's one of the stiffer varieties of buffing mop, and I'm using a brown Tripoli compound on that, which is kind of a medium grit buffing compound. And then I'm working my way around with that. Now, buffing wheels are frankly quite dangerous, so you really wanna be careful with this, especially with sheet metal. You wanna work at or below the center line, and you wanna be very, very careful to keep the edges of the material away from the mop. That mop will grab them with no warning, and you can hurt yourself or ruin the part. You can see the effect there with the reflection of the not-sponsored sticker there. It does a very nice job. And, well, remember what I said about being careful with buffing wheels? Just as I was finishing up this part, I was literally pulling the part away from the wheel for the final time, and my hand tipped forward a little bit, and the wheel grabbed it and mangled it, just like that, in a split second. Camera wasn't rolling, unfortunately, but you'll have to imagine my frustration. Well, let's see if we can recover this. I've got a scrap of aluminum there to act as kind of a dolly, and I'm going to channel my inner Carl Fisher, or perhaps Ron Covell, if you like, and try to do some sheet metal work here and save this thing. I banged out all the dents and wrinkles as best I could, then I used the cylinder casting as a hammer form, and I hammer formed it back around there to get all of the misshapenness out of it as best I could. So I got the shape back, I got a couple of deep scratches there that I may not be able to get out, but more time on the scotch Bright wheel and then more time on the buffing wheel, and I think it came out pretty good. We 90% saved it, I would say. Then some rubbing alcohol cleans up the residue of the buffing compound, which is a wax base. If you look closely, you can see that while it is pretty mirror-like, there are some very fine scratches in there, and that's the brown Tripoli compound. If you want to go further than this to go for a real pure mirror, the next step would probably be to use an unstitched wheel, which is a softer buffing wheel, and something like a jeweler's rouge, the next finer compound stage. And you want to change the direction of buffing between compounds so that you're canceling out the scratches from the previous compound. But that's more work than I'm interested in doing here. As you can see from normal viewing distance, we've got really good reflectivity there. And in a futile attempt to preserve the finish, I'm going to put this brake caliper clear coat on it. Unfortunately, this stuff almost always, I find, dulls the finish, as you did here. So my mirror is back to satin, unfortunately. This was a bit of a fool's errand anyway, because this brass is going to tarnish no matter what you do. There's two things on steam engines that cause brass to tarnish, air and heat. A clear coat will protect it from air tarnishing, but something like this part that's going to be exposed to heat is going to tarnish from the heat no matter what you do. So this was really more just a learning experience. These were processes that I wanted to try out on this brass, and I learned a lot doing it for the future. In fact, it would be traditional to actually paint the part at this point, not leave it brass like I'm doing, but this engine has so many painted surfaces on it that I wanted more brass to kind of mix it up. We'll see how it looks. I can always paint it later if I decide to. There's the final result. A few things went well, a few things went less well, but I'm really happy with how this came out in the end. I hope you enjoyed the process of making it, and as you can see, this engine is getting very close to being finished. When you weren't looking, I painted it. That'll be in the next video in this series, so stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.